Hi there, this is David Dyer again, and this in this video we're going to be talking about a translation we did of the New Testament. I have one here I'm going to show you. This is our New Testament. It's called the Father's Life New Testament. <clears throat> this is a brand new translation. It's been out maybe four or five years. But when we did the translation, a friend of mine asked me a question. Why do we need another translation of the New Testament? Why did you do that? Well, that's a good question, because it was a lot of work. It took almost four years to complete. Some of that time I was working 12 to 14 hours a day, and it was a big job. So it's a valid question. Why in the world? The person do it. There are dozens already, if not hundreds, of translations of the New Testament and the Bible out there. Why do we need another one? The I think even the gays have their translation. The feminists have their translation where they, I've never read it, but I think they portray God as a woman. So there's so many New Testaments out there. Why do we need another one? Well, the answer is because all of them have a serious and significant failing. They have failed to translate adequately and intelligibly the word life. Now, some of you may have heard this message or something like it before. But I believe it is so critical and so important that I want to talk about it once again. Jesus came with a purpose. Several purposes, which are all joined together into one purpose. In a previous video, we talked about his purpose to change us to be holy people. But part of this process, as part of this process, he came to give us life. In John 10:10, 10, 10 we read, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Now it turns out that in the Greek language, there are three words which are translated into one English word, life. And the failure to distinguish between these words in our translations and translate them all equally has led to confusion, uh, stupidity, error, and all kinds of problems that I consider really serious problems. If you don't understand what kind of life Jesus came to bring, you cannot understand the gospel. Let me repeat that. If you do not understand the life that Jesus brought us, there's no way you can figure out the New Testament. There's no way you can understand the Gospel. It's just a confusing mess. And so we're going to take some time here, investigate this, and try to clarify this question so that the hearers and the readers of our books can really enjoy the fullness of what Jesus came to do. <clears throat> there are three Greek words for life. They're all translated as one English word, but they are three different and distinct words. In John 10.10, 10, we read, Jesus came that we might have life. Now, one Greek word for that is bios, B-I-O-S. I'm going to read a definition here from the internet. The duration of our life, the manner of life in regard to its moral conduct, I mean, what we physically do. We do good, we do evil. The means of life, our livelihood and means of making a living. I'm sure that also since it refers to our body, Bios is sort of where we get our word biology, a physical life. 
I'm sure that also includes our health. So if Jesus came to bring us bios or bios, then we could be certain that he came to bring us health and prosperity. And long life. Health, prosperity, and long life. And there are a lot of people, not just a few people, but a lot of people out there preaching this gospel, the bios gospel, that Jesus wants to bless us materially, prosper us, give us long life, and heal us from anything and everything. That is a very common gospel that's out there. It's not hard to find. This would be the gospel of bios. I am come that you might have bios. But as you might suspect, that is not the Greek word in John 10.10. 10. The other word, Greek word, we're going to talk about is Pisuke or suke, P S U C H E, with an accent over the E. And this word is our soul life, our psychological life. Let me read a little definition about that here. The life of the soul or soul. In fact, sometimes this word is translated soul in the New Testament. The seat of personality our self-life. So this could be our psychological life, our intellectual life, our inner soul life, our self-life. And if Jesus came to bring us this life, then we could expect to be happy, emotionally well-adjusted, uh, intellectually stimulated, have a very vibrant and happy life. But, as you may suspect, in John 10.10, 10, the Greek word is not suke. Instead of this, the Greek word is zoe. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this word. But, essentially, it means the life of God. And I'm going to read you some verses that prove this. Jesus came to bring us the life of the Father. Now this is very strange, because it's not a life that we already have. It has nothing to do with the two kinds of lives we possess as human beings, our biological life or our psychological life. Instead, it's the life of another being outside of us. We can receive, Jesus brought to us, the life of another being, the Father, an uncreated life. This is what Jesus came to bring us. And it turns out that this life can be born inside of us. God can inject, if you will, this life into our being. Now, this is not a physical injection. Somehow, Mary, the mother of Jesus, when the power of God came on her and she was enveloped in a haze of brilliance, God deposited a physical life in her and Jesus was born. But we are not talking about a physical life here nothing to do with uh, the womb, but a spiritual life. Jesus explained to Nicodemus that what is born of the Holy Spirit is our human spirit. That's the small s in the Greek. The large s means the Holy Spirit, and the small s means the human spirit. But there has been a lot of confusion about what Jesus came to bring. If you do not understand that eternal life is the life of an eternal being, the life of God himself, the life of someone outside of yourself that is deposited within you, you cannot 
clearly understand the gospel. I would like to read a definition when looking through the Strong's numbers on the internet. I came across one of the uh, studious Bible scholars who, who gave us his definition of Zoe life. Let me read it to you. A real and genuine life, a life active and vigorous, devoted to God, blessed in the portion even in this world of those who put their trust in Christ, but after the res resurrection to be consummated by new accessions, among them a more perfect body, and a life to last forever. Whoa. What a bunch of darkness. Somebody did not understand eternal life. This has nothing to do with the gospel. But most of the church, the vast majority of Christians, have no notion, none, about what eternal life is. They think it's an improvement of their own lives. They imagine that it's an extension of their own lives. They have all these confused and uh, unfounded ideas because the scriptures are not clear. Our translations, the Greek is clear, but our translations in English do not differentiate between these Greek words. This is a tragedy. This is terrible. It's left us with millions or even billions of believers who have no idea what eternal life is. There is a scripture that says eternal life is to know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, who he has sent. Okay, that's good. It involves knowing Jesus Christ and knowing the Father. That's all good. But that is not enough to clarify for us something that the Greek text makes exceedingly clear that there is a different kind of life. It's not our biological life. It's not our psychological life. It's another life that we receive. Let me read Vines, W. E. Vine in his dictionary of expository words of the New Testament <clears throat> defines Zoe life like this. Life as God has it. That which the Father has in himself and which he gave to the incarnate Son to have in himself and which the Son manifested to the world. Amen. Now there's a man who had revelation. He knew what Zoe life was. It's the life of the incarnate Son, which was given to him by the Eternal Father. And he came so that we could have it too. Now I realize that the word zoe in ancient Greek did not refer to the life of God. It had other meanings. And that's part of what the confusion is. But the writers of the New Testament selected this word and used it in a very specific way. Only a couple of times in the New Testament is the word zoe used in the traditional Greek context or meaning. Most of the time, the writers of the New Testament use this word to refer to the life of God. Now, I'm going to read some verses to prove to you that this is what Jesus came to bring us. The life of the Father, a life without beginning and without end, a life which spans the ages, that's what eternal means, a life that is not merely everlasting, but eternal. Let me read a few verses. In John 1.13, we read about those who were not born through bloodlines, no, nor through the choice of the flesh, or by 
decision of man, but were actually born of God. Born of God. That's what John says. We can be born of God. Just as you were born of your parents, you can be born of God. In John chapter 3, verses 3 and 7, Jesus talks to Nicodemus, explains to him that you can be born from on high or born from above. Now most of our translations say born again. But if you click on that Greek word, the Strong's numbers of that Greek word, there is nothing in there to imply again or another time. There's nothing about that word. The translators made a decision to translate that born again because it's a traditional Christian phrase. But if you think about it, <clears throat> being born from on high or from above is much clearer. It shows the origin of this new birth. It shows where it came from. It came from on high, outside of ourselves, something that we didn't have before. I'm going to go on and read some other verses. Again in John 1.12, the next verse, But as many as received him, he gave them the privilege of becoming offspring of God specifically to those who are believing into his name. This means we become God's children, sons of God, not adopted sons. You know, the Bible, <clears throat> the New Testament, many of the translations use the word adoption. But in the, that culture, the old culture adoption does not refer to what we think of as adoption, where someone goes and takes a child that is not born from their family and places them in their family and raises them as their own child. That is not what the Greek scriptures mean for adoption. It means literally to place as a son in the Hebrew culture, I believe, when a child reached 13 years of age, they had a ceremony to place them as an adult son in the family. Before that, they were a child. But then they became an adult or a son, and they had a special ceremony to declare this to everyone around them, that this son had finally grown up. Now, this is what adoption really means in the New Testament. Let's go on. 1 Peter 1.23, I'm reading here from the New King James Version. Having been born again, or regenerated, is a better word, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Wow, think about that. Incorruptible seed. In Acts, in another <clears throat> place of the New Testament, we find that this word corruption was very interesting. The, the early disciples used this idea of corruption as a key tool in evangelizing the Jews. This is because David prophesied about Christ that he would not leave his body in the grave and he wouldn't leave his Holy One to see corruption. This means, by that he meant, the body would not decay. It would stay in death and it wouldn't decay, it wouldn't corrupt. Now if you think about it, every life, <clears throat> every life in this world dies and then decays. I don't know if maybe over there in Russia, Stalin or Lenin or someone is, 
encased in some kind of coffin with a nitrogen atmosphere or something that keeps it from decaying. But every life, plant life, animal life, dies and decays. It corrupts. So by calling this seed incorruptible, that's important. It's a seed that doesn't decay. It's an eternal seed. It's a divine seed. It's the seed which germinates in us through the Holy Spirit of the life of God the Father. Let's read some other verses. Paul tells Timothy <clears throat> in 1 Timothy, at the end of Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, talking about God, the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality. Wow, this is interesting. God is the only truly immortal being. Immortal meaning not just long living, but ever existing, without beginning and without end. The only immortal being. He alone has immortality. Well, that was right at the end of his letter to First Timothy, but he must have been thinking about his letter after he wrote it. So right at the beginning of 2 Timothy, he makes a small adjustment. Not that it's wrong to say that only God has immortality, but he says in 1 Timothy 1.10, This purpose has now been revealed by the appearing, the appearing of our Savior, the Anointed One, Jesus, who rendered death ineffective and brought the eternal life of God even immortality to light through the gospel. <laughs> okay, so I thought, wait a minute. Yes, God is the unique and original immortal being, but he is sharing this life with others. It's been brought to light through the gospel. Part of the good news message is that God is not retaining this life for himself. He's sharing it. He's giving it to those who believe. We can become his sons. We can be born of God. We can receive a life that we did not have before. And this life is eternal. Now this understanding of Zoe life, of John 10.10, 10, of what Jesus came to bring us, the kind of life that Jesus came to bring us, is essential for understanding the New Testament. This is why I felt it necessary to take so much time and to make a new translation. Without it, it's just a confusion. For example, if you save your life, you'll lose it, the Bible says. Well, but if you lose your life, you'll gain it. Well, that's so strange. Why, already, why would I want to lose life to have life? I have a life already. I want more of it. I don't want to lose it. I want more. I want some good stuff. It's completely confusing. What's all this talk about losing your life? What's all this talk about cru being crucified? What does that mean? It's all so confusing. If you don't see, if you don't distinguish between the three different Greek words for life. The New Testament message does not make sense. This is essential. It's a must. You have to have this. I'll read a verse here from John 12, 25. He who loves his soul life, that suke, loves who and what he is, will have it destroyed. Well, that's handy. But he who has a deep aversion to his soul life, hates who and what he is in this world, 
will guard themselves and flee from it into the eternal life of God. This is what it is. I am translating the word, have it destroyed, from gloss, his definition is to destroy utterly, kill, or slay. That is Strong's number 622. To to watch, to guard themselves and flee from it, <clears throat> I am quoting from Strong's. To be on guard, by implication, to persevere, avoid. Thayer says to avoid, flee from, or shun. Only with the correct translation, the clear translation, can we see why we need a new life? The old life, the suke life, is defective. It's sinful and it needs to be destroyed. And it can be destroyed by the operation of the cross today in this lifetime. The biological life also God has provided us salvation for. <clears throat> this is called the glorification of the body. This is something that happens after our physical death. At the second coming of Jesus, our bodies will be glorified. So we don't worry about the bios life now. We just watch it so it doesn't get out of hand. <laughs> and Paul says, I beat my body and keep it under. I watch it. So that after, after preaching to others, I myself do not become disqualified or become a castaway. But bi biological life doesn't enter in very much to the gospel. <clears throat> the hope of the salvation of the body is a future hope. It's the hope of glory. But the hope we have today is being rid of and free from our suke life and having it replaced with the Zoe life of God. This is a wonderful and marvelous salvation. Now I hope from this you see the necessity for a new translation. This is the reason why I started out to do a new New Testament, to clarify and help believers who are confused what life is what, to see and understand more clearly God's plan. 